Now, from time to time, I end up in this edit facility because Brian's usually working on know-how stuff, but recently I've noticed he has a couple of Raspberry Pis, and you're building some kind of Nintendo MAME thing going here, right? Yeah, that's right. Actually, one of those Raspberry Pis is yours, so I should probably give that back to you after this. Well, since I haven't noticed it missing, clearly you see how often I use it. So right. you're actually giving it a good use. You're going to make it, well, you got this really beautiful looking case for this Raspberry Pi, but this is the Model B? Or? This is the uh, Model A, the 256 megabyte version, the, the lesser of the two. But if you're going to do this uh, main project, it works just as well. All right, so how do we get started on making our Raspberry Pi? into a Nintendo meme. Uh, so I first got started when I saw a Lifehacker article for build an all-in-one retro game console for $35. So since I had a couple Raspberry Pis on hand, I thought this was probably the coolest project I could do with it. And it goes through a pretty simple list of everything that you need to put everything together. But the more in-depth uh, website that I used that helped a lot was the Super Nintendo Pi. Uh, website that has a lot of details and a lot of step-by-step -step stuff that you need to get started. What I'm using is an 8 gigabyte SD card which should be more than enough for all the ROMs and everything that we want to use for this project. First thing you're going to want to do is download the RetroPie image from PetRockBlock.com. Next, because I'm using a Mac, I'm going to use the RPI SD card builder and what that's going to do is put together the image onto the SD card so that the Raspberry Pi can read it and it'll boot into emulation station. And it's gonna come up with this white screen uh, asking you to map your controller specifically for emulation station. Follow the instructions and now you'll be inside of emulation station. Now obviously we haven't moved over any ROMs. These are just some of the default things that pop up. Uh, you've got your Apple II, uh, Doom, and a couple other things uh, listed in here. So since I've mapped the left bumper to exit out of the, the emulator, that's what I'll do. Now that we're in terminal, we're going to want to set up our global emulator settings uh, for our controllers. And to do that, you're going to type in CD RetroPie slash emulator slash RetroArch tools. And then after that, you're going to do dot slash RetroArch joy config RetroPie configs all RetroArch dot CFG. So what you're doing here is mapping the global settings for your controller. Uh, in our case, we're using this SNES controller. And our next step is to set up the Raspberry Pi config. So in terminal, I'll type in sudo raspberry config. And in this menu system, uh, the first thing we want to do is expand the root FS. And that'll give the Raspberry Pi enough room on the SD card for updating. Once that's finished, you'll want to go to the memory split section. Now, depending on whether you have the 512 megabyte version of the Raspberry Pi or the 256 megabyte version, you want to split it accordingly. So the 256, you'll do it in half, one, so put in 128, and for the 512, you want to do 256. So exit to terminal. The next step is to update your Pi. What you're going to want to do is type in CD RetroPi setup and then sudo dot slash RetroPi setup dot sh. So this will load up the script for updating your Pi, and you'll want to update script, then update binaries, and then finally run binaries-based installation. This will take a while, so you might want to go uh, make a cup of coffee or something. Then the next step is to move your ROMs and edit your config files. So in terminal, you want to type in ifconfig, and what that'll do is show you what your IP address is, so that we can use an FTP client to log into it. Now, why FTP over just simply trying to take the ROM files and putting them on the SD card directly? Uh, because if you just try and take the SD card out of the Raspberry Pi and put it in your computer, you're not going to be able to see any of those folders. You can't read any of the files. Exactly. Okay. So, and it's a real pain in the butt if you're trying to put all your ROMs on a USB drive and then transfer them over in the OS to the folders. I tried doing that and it took forever and you have to unplug the key. there's only two usb ports so you have to have your keyboard and your mouse plugged in and you're trying to move the files over and then you reboot the raspberry pi to make sure it worked you have to unplug the mouse to plug in your controller and the ftp client we're using is cyberduck um, and you want to go into quick connection sftp then the server number that you got from looking at your when you typed in ifconfig 
And then the user for default is always pi, and the password for default is always raspberry, all lowercase. Then navigate to your RetroPie ROMs. I only want to see the Sega, the NES, and the Super Nintendo. I'm gonna create an unused folder and move these emulator, other emulators in there. Uh, I'm not deleting them, so I can get them back later if I want to. But uh, this way, when I load up Emulation Station, these will be the only three emulators that I see loaded up. Transfer the ROMs accordingly to the folders for each one. So, so I'll be doing the NES, the SNES, and the Sega. And then now that you have all your ROMs moved over, you want to navigate to your RetroPie configs and then all config file. The controllers for me were a long process of trial and error and I have configured them to my preferences. I will make these available on our website uh, show notes so people can copy these and paste them right into their config files and not have to go through the pain and suffering that I did uh, figuring out what buttons were mapped to what. Here's the individual NES config file and the SNES config file. And what you're going to want to do for the Sega Genesis is just do these input menu toggle button and input enable hotkey and input emulate, exit emulator. And what these hotkeys are going to allow you to do is get into the menu system for uh, each emulator that you're in and you can adjust uh, the settings accordingly if you like and you'll be able to access save states and you can load states, which is pretty awesome. You can also edit the config files from inside the emulator on the fly if you are, aren't satisfied with, with what you have. Basically, that's all you really need to do to get set up and start playing emulators on your Raspberry Pi. But if you'd like to take it another step further and make things a little bit prettier, you'd go to terminal again, do CD RetroPie setup, sudo dot slash RetroPie underscore setup dot sh and what you're going to do is run ES scraper uh, what that does is it goes and it fetches all the information from scraping the what ROMs are available in your folders and it'll pull album art and descriptions uh, for all your games and make it a little bit cooler looking on the emulation station UI now when I've tried this it has about a 80% chance of getting the game right most of the games on my list are correct with the title and the image, but there are a few that aren't correct. And what we're going to have to do for that is go into the gamelist.xml and edit those manually. I'm using a program called Text Wrangler to edit these XML files. If you're using a PC, uh, Notepad++ is another great program for that. But what you can do is go into the game list, edit the title accordingly, and insert your own description to your liking. And I'm going to put for Final Fantasy, because this is Final Fantasy 3, and then I'm going to change the description. Let's see, Final Fantasy 3 is also known as Final Fantasy 6 and is one of my favorite games. So now if we save the XML, exit out, reboot the Pi, now when we log back into Emulation Station, you can see it no longer says Final Fantasy 2, but Final Fantasy 3, the way I'd like it. I had a lot of fun doing this project, and I definitely stress tested a lot by playing a lot of these games, making sure that this worked perfectly. And it was pretty popular, a lot of uh, people came in and tested it for me, which uh, I appreciated. So... Brian's brilliant plan is to somehow put a Raspberry Pi in this actual case. And we want to have the ports on the back. Now obviously, uh, there are some issues. We're looking at a networking uh, jack here. This doesn't exactly line up with anything. So instead of trying to reuse these holes, which we really can't, we're going to have to make this larger. As this is an old piece of technology, this is a 1985 Nintendo piece, we didn't want to break it off the bat because I'll be honest, I haven't worked with plastic very much when it comes to cutting things. I'm usually using wood. So if you look down and around, you will see a plethora of ideas or, or things that we're using to come up with a substitute uh, and tests. All right, so this is a piece of plastic from a discarded hard drive, an enclosure. And I'm finding they seem to be pretty good. As you can see, all my cuts 
look like garbage. And we want a nice finished look to this. So we're trying to figure out how we can do this. Here's the first cut I did. You can see, wow, that would look really lovely on the back, right? I mean, it's Brian's house, so he's gonna be seeing it all the time when he's looking behind his Nintendo. But we don't want it to look like this. We got a little bit better around here and over here. And what I figured was, why not try to use metal instead? You can see this hole here. You can see it's squared off because first what I did was I drilled a hole using a drill. Exciting. Next, I use this tool. What this device does, we'll find the official name soon. He calls it the nibbler. I don't know what it really is, but you can see this piece up here. When it clamps down, it actually makes a square hole. So if I go into this piece of metal and I place it towards myself and I cut, it continues to be square. So I should be able to notch out a nice looking hole if I wanted to do that. So the idea is to come up with a plate that will house this uh, Cat5 cable receptacle, otherwise known as an Ethernet jack, smart guy. So something like this, you can see if I keep cutting away, I might actually have something. And also has to house our HDMI. So this is obviously not gonna fit because we're trying to figure this out. What we'll do in theory is we will cut out the back of this and reuse this spot. The plate will sit behind it, kind of like that. So you'd have a plate there. Actually, it wouldn't be that far back, but you get the idea. That way we can do all of our modifications on the plate and then attach the plate to the Nintendo. It looks like somebody just chomped it. So that's the problem. This is ugly. I don't know if I want, you know, even though this is the back of your system, Brian, Brian's behind the camera if you guys don't realize that, I don't think I want this sitting back there. I think we're gonna have to try a different approach. Okay, look, we really want this to be pretty and that metal thing, I think if we spent hours and hours and hours, it might look really good. Then I realized something, something popped out in my head. I'm like, wait a second. What if there was a thing I could just pop in here? And I'm like, it's called a keystone, like down here. Now, if you look under this desk, you'll see a wall plate with, these have ethernet keystones. Well, they are HDMI keystones and a uh, Ethernet one. What we're gonna do is get a wall plate, a couple of keystones, trim that wall plate down so we can fit it in here. We're still gonna have to take a piece of plastic off, but it'll give us a nice, clean, finished look when we actually put this together. All right, so earlier today I took a wall plate and I obviously cut off parts of it to make this small enough to fit into this space. Now, what I found was the width of this at least the ports kind of line up almost exactly the same as this piece on the Nintendo. So what we're gonna do is cut out a piece across this way, trying to use this opening as well. We wanna make sure there's room around the HDMI cable for the actual cable. Also, there's gonna be a networking port right here. We'll show you that in a minute. But what I wanna do next is cut this piece out and hopefully this will line up nicely. And uh, shall we go ahead and sacrifice the Nintendo uh, first goggles though before I start cutting into it because I don't want flying pieces of plastic. This part rubbed against it. Uh. I'm sorry, Brian. All right, so I've marred the surface here. Turns out that when I was using the Dremel tool, the actual collar of the device brushed up against the back of the Nintendo, making it a big, horrible gouge. I apologize, Brian, for your device, but I'm gonna try to make this nice and neat to make it up to you. Um, I don't know how to fix that, so sorry about it. This is how we learn. We only have one of these Nintendos. We've already mounted our USB ports here. Probably wanted to do that at the end if we were gonna do this over again, but we were building it pretty much uh, in place. So the fact that it worked and we wanted to keep testing it means that the order might not have been exactly the correct way to go, but it's working. So for the USBs to fit into the case, we had to cut one of the pillars. Next, Ayaz was able to cut out a piece of wood with a little slat that we could use to hold it in place. We were able to hot glue the wood to the case of the NES, which gave the USBs the extra strength that they would need for if you were gonna be plugging in and unplugging uh, USB controllers to it. And we also got lucky with the USB hub that we ordered for the project, where when I took it out of the case, it had mounting holes that were perfectly aligned with the NES case holsters. The next thing we wanted to do was find uh, a mounting place for the Raspberry Pi. I found some mounting holsters for the Raspberry Pi on Adafruit.com, 
and we were able to measure out three holes along the base of the NES. It took us a little while to get the Raspberry Pi into the holsters, but once it was in there, it was very secure. So while Ayaz was busy trying to figure out how to mount the plate to the back of the Raspberry Pi, me and Padre uh, started working on the power switch for the NES. There's a website called Mosberry Circuits, and you find a shutdown switch for the Raspberry Pi. Now what you can do is solder the existing NES power switch to the uh, Mosberry circuit, and what that allows you to do is send a script to the Raspberry Pi, which will shut it down safely, uh, rather than just a hard shutdown, which isn't good for the Pi. Once we had completed soldering the power and reset switch to the Mosberry circuit, uh, and the next step was to figure out how to get the LED, the existing LED, to work with uh, the Raspberry Pi. So we had soldered a couple of wires to the actual LED on the board. We had to cut the connecting circuit to the reset switch. The reason I cut on the board here was so that the signal wouldn't be sent to the reset switch, also shorting out the Pi. And also when we had first tried plugging in the Nintendo uh, LED, it was yellow instead of red. So that meant that it was actually getting too much power from the Raspberry Pi and we put a resistor in the line uh, and connected it to the LED, which then fixed the problem and gave us the uh, red light that we were hoping for. Now that we've got the hole in the NES, what we want to do is modify the wall plate. We have this extension cord for our USB hub, and what we're going to do is have this part of it sticking out the back next to the HDMI. It's going to be seated right in the middle of our HDMI and our soon-to-be networking port. Uh, I've got a drill bit here. I'm also going to do a bit of countersinking, so this can be as flush as possible with the actual wall plate, and we'll work with our power adapter. It's almost like I know what I'm talking about, but I don't. Somewhere right around there. Uh, that's about right. And if it's screwed up, I mean, it's just Brian's anyway, right? Like, what's he gonna do? Always, always wear your goggles. Because we've got plastic flying everywhere. All right, so we've punched down our uh, keystone for networking. On the other end is an ethernet cable, so we can attach that to the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I have a pretty long cable. That's because from what I've read, and I'm sure you know-it-alls will know whether this is true or not, there's supposed to be a minimum length when it comes to ethernet. It's supposed to be about a meter. Now, this is obviously ridiculously long. It should cover the meter and should be prevent crosstalk. That's why you want a, lo a long run here. We're just gonna pop in our keystone and our jack here, and let's go. What's next? Let's line up some things. Now, last we left off, we had our wall plate. This was hours ago. I wish there was a clock behind me so you could see how many hours it's been. So here you can see the wall plate, and we've got a power cable really glued in there nicely, and we've got our HDMI keystone right there. Uh, there were issues with it. Hot glue was not gonna hold that plate enough. And if you look right now, you're like, what the heck just happened? We've had to use screws uh, because I marred the case. Brian gave me the go ahead to get some screws into this. So we could fix the wall plate, but there was an issue. As we would push HDMI cables or Cat5 cable, what would happen is the wall plate would move up. So what do I do? I went with wood because I found some wood around here, screwed it down, and what it does is it provides enough downward pressure. So every time I push, it moved up. We wanna stop that, we'll put this back on, and I think, Brian's gonna put the rest of this back together because apart from this, I think the only thing left, the easy part, is putting it all back together, like putting the Raspberry Pi on its standoffs, hooking up the HDMI, and all that other fun stuff. Uh, that's coming up next. So now I've got the, all the components back together, boot up the Raspberry Pi, and we've got ourselves an NES case, MAME system, with a Raspberry Pi inside of it. I wouldn't say it's as easy as Pi to make, but it was definitely a fun project. And uh, if you've been looking for something cool to do with your Raspberry Pi, I highly suggest uh, giving this project a shot.